Good morning and welcome to Sunday School. Uh, I hope you're having a wonderful Sunday morning. We are continuing through the book of John. So we're going to be in John chapter 6. You can go ahead and turn there. And as you do, I want you to think about this. What's the difference between a want and a need? What's the difference between a want and a need? Uh, another thing to consider is how can they be confused with each other? How can we confuse a need and say so we need something, but in reality it's just something we want or vice versa? So think about this. A need is something that is essential uh, for living or uh, accomplishing a goal. If you don't have such and such, you can't do something else, right? You can't do your goal. You can't live. So a need is something that is required. It's essential. So therefore, a want is something that's not essential but it's simply something a person desires or wants to have. And so a need versus a want. We, we understand these words. We understand the definitions. But sometimes we do, uh, and we have, and we probably will, confuse these things. Uh, wanting something, even though uh, we think we need it, it's simply just a want. So, uh, I don't know about you, but uh, I have been informed by my parents, specifically my dad. Uh, he would often respond to my statement of, I need blank, whatever it was, I need this with need or want. And he brings up a good point. A lot of times our, the things we think we need are simply wants or desires. And so today we are going to be looking at uh, how Jesus responded to a, a crowd of people who were simply looking for free food. Yet, Jesus knew that they needed something more. And so uh, the passage uh, that we're going to be studying today comes in the context of the feeding of the 5,000. So uh, Jesus here uh, was wanting to challenge the disciples in their faith. And so he asked them about food, feeding the crowd of people. It starts in verses 1 through 6. And so uh, he showed um, compassion on the people, desiring to offer food to, to feed them. But also this is an opportunity to, to, for the disciples to grow in their faith. And so what we have is this situation where uh, the fourth sign where Jesus feeds the five and so this crowd of people uh, experienced this and, and then later were pursuing or, or wanting to find Jesus and the disciples. Uh, in between this and verses 16 through 21, we see Jesus uh, walk on water. This is the fifth sign in the, in the book of John. And so we see this right here. Um, and, but um, uh, leading into the passage we're studying today, after feeding the 5,000, after walking on water, they come and they are searching for Jesus and his disciples uh, in verses 22 through 25. And so they, they come to the other side of the lake. They find Jesus and they ask the question, when did you get here? How did you get here, essentially? Um, and so when did you get here? So that leads us to verses 26, where we're going to start our passage. So let's read verses 26. Uh, Rabbi, when did you get here is verse 25. So they're looking for Jesus. They're asking questions. And, and Jesus gets to the heart of the issue. Verse 26, Jesus answered, Truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal of approval on him. What can we do to perform the works of God? They asked. Jesus replied, This is the work of God, that you believe in the one he has sent. You have believed in the one he has sent. And so Jesus, in these verses, is uh, very much addressing the desires and the wants of the crowd. Uh, what were they there for? Why were they looking for him? And he points out the fact that they had a wrong motive for seeking after Jesus. And so if you look at it in verse 26, you are looking for me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. They wanted food. Uh, but let's take a step back and think about this. What are some of the, the reasons or motives that people have for coming to Jesus? When I think about it, uh, there's this, this offer of hope. Or, or, or peace when you come to Jesus, hearing the, the gospel. So there's a desire for hope, peace, etc., forgiveness. Uh, maybe in death or disaster, uh, there's just overwhelming circumstances and looking for something that just something gets our attention, attention and wakes us up. And so we're looking for uh, truth. We're looking for our hope in, in Jesus. 
perhaps some pain or shame or despair. You know, we're we're in a situation where we need some relief. We need uh, we, we need some relief from the shame and the guilt that we feel, knowing that we can't save ourselves. So we come to Jesus. Brokenness over sin is another. Being convicted of sin, curiosity is another thing. But I guess another question to think about is: Is it possible to have the wrong motives? I mean, the answer is obviously yes. Jesus is uh, addressing that here. And what are some of the potential wrong motives that someone has for coming to Jesus? Well, I would say this. Uh, food, obviously. Coming to Jesus for food, just for physical food, is the wrong motive. Um, parents or grandparents or other people's expectations in our life. If, if we are told to come to Jesus uh, just because it will please our parents, um, it's, it's the wrong motivation. It's not the wrong result, but it is the wrong motivation. Uh, treating God like Santa Claus, essentially trying to get what you want from Jesus, just trying to get what you want, uh, trying to treat God as an insurance policy. There are some wrong motives for coming to Jesus. And even in this situation and in the situations we just talked about, I guess the question I have is how can God still work in their lives? People who come to Jesus when the wrong motivations. And the answer is this, that God's word does not return void. This is a verse in Isaiah 55, 11. So my word that comes from my mouth will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I please and will prosper in what I send it to do. There are other passages talking about the, the fact that the, the gospel, the scripture, is as profitable for instruction and reproof. This is talking about in Timothy. But it, scripture leads to salvation because scripture shares the gospel. And so when people hear the word of God, the Holy Spirit uses it to convict people of their sin. So even in the midst of wrong motives for coming to Jesus, God can still use those encounters. Both in this situation, we're going to see he, he got to the heart of the issue, but also today, even now. So yes, our motives for coming to Jesus can be wrong. They can be right. They can be confused. They can be uh, just off track. But God uses his word to convict us of sins. And so he is trying to wake them up to the fact that they're, they're just wanting free food, but they need something more. So we, we look at Jesus' response to, uh, well, he, he's responding right here to the crowd when they came, but verse 27 takes it a little bit further, and he gets to the real um, heart of the issue. He says, don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his appeal, excuse me, set his seal of approval on him. Um, I was uh, reading this, and I was thinking about the, the, the food that lasts, and I was thinking of things that last, and um, I don't know why, but my mind went to a sandcastle. So when, when was the last time you either built a sandcastle or watched someone else build a sandcastle? How long did it last? Probably not very long. long. No matter how well a, a sandcastle is built, it won't last very long. The, the waves are going to come in, it's going to fall, it's going to crumble. And that's the point. It's to have fun, to enjoy it and whatnot, uh, but it's not meant to last. It makes me think of the story of uh, the one, the fool, builds his house upon the sand. And so uh, it's just not going to last. And so uh, the the context of this verse, the, the, the Jewish background, the historical precedence, uh, really is all the way back in Isaiah. Uh, there's a verse, Isaiah 55, 2, which is closely connected to this, and I think uh, is very much something that Jesus would probably be uh, <clears throat> trying to remind them of. In Isaiah 55, 2, it says, Why do you spend silver on what is not food, and your wages on what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and you will enjoy the choicest of foods. This whole passage, this chapter, talks about coming to the Lord, um, uh, coming to that which truly satisfies. And it uses this analogy and, and just basically gives this emphasis that don't labor for things that can never truly satisfy. And Jesus is saying the same thing. Why do you, why do you work? Why do you labor? Or saying don't work or labor for food that, uh, that perishes, but for the food that never perishes, uh, for that, but the food that lasts for eternal life. Jesus is saying there's so much more than just eating. 
There's so much more than just the physical. And so he's, he's trying to make this emphasis for them. And, and what he does is he acknowledges the, the fact that the Son of Man is going to be the one who gives it to you, right? So we see uh, this reference to himself as, as the Son of Man, uh, connection to Daniel, connection to his deity, um, his coming as the Messiah. But it says, because God the Father has set his seal of approval on him. So why is it important? that God the Father has set his seal of approval on Jesus. Why is that important for Jesus to emphasize? Uh, we see uh, in Jesus' baptism where the dove descends from heaven, and, and, and this is my beloved Son in whom I am uh, pleased, right? We see this approval and this, this uh, indication of Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the one who is sent. Why is that important? And I think the reason it is important is because Jesus has the authority and the power to offer eternal life. Jesus has that authority. He has that power. And he wants, uh, he's, he's bringing this offer to people to believe and to trust in him. And so uh, these two verses uh, I- I indicate and demonstrate their, um, their wrong priorities in life because they were looking for physical, whereas there was something more important to um to their life and to to Jesus as well, the reason he came. So they had the wrong motives, they had the wrong priorities, but then we see their response is essentially saying, okay, well, we want this food that lasts forever. Um, we're going to talk about it in just a minute. They, they misunderstood what Jesus was talking about, but not only that, they misunderstood how they would receive or acquire this uh, food that lasts, this eternal um, life, so to speak, from this food. Uh, verse 28 says, what can we do to perform, perform the works of God, they asked. Jesus replied, this is the work of God that you believe in the one he has sent. And what we see is they, they offer up or they ask this in inquiry as to, well, what do I need to do? What are the works I need to do? Verse 27 says, don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts. And so they're like, okay, well, what do I need to do? What boxes do I need to check? And so as I was thinking about this, I was like, what do these, um, what does this question, the crowd's question, reveal about them? And really, it, it reveals their culture, their, their Jewish culture, uh, um, focusing on religious and moral works in order to be right with God. That reveals the culture that they were living in. They wanted to check the boxes off so they could be in a right standing with God. And that led me to think about this. In what ways is our culture similar? How do we uh, sometimes have these same tendencies? And if you think about it, uh, we oftentimes emphasize, our culture emphasizes doing good. If we, if we go to church, if we do good deeds, and, and we don't do anything terrible, then you will be on good terms uh, with the, the big guy upstairs, so to speak. This, this, this culture, this Americanized culture of this, well, just if you do enough good, it outweighs your bad. Uh, what are the boxes I need to check in order to be a good person? And so um, what they missed and what they misunderstood and what Jesus corrects them is it's not by works but it's by faith. That's what he says in verse 29. This is the work of God, that you believe in the one he has sent. You believe in the one he has sent. And so um, notice uh, what they said in verse 28. It's uh, what, are, what, what can we do to perform the works of God? So we have this plural word there. It seems like they are saying, what do I need to do? What are the things I need to do? But Jesus is saying there's one thing. The work of God is to believe in the one he has sent. Uh, and so um, this faith comes, uh, this faith is what, uh, 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 faith is the means of salvation. And so that's what Jesus is trying to get at. Uh, I wanted to read another passage, Romans chapter 4, verses 3 through 4. It says, For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness. Now the one who works Pay is not credited as a gift, but as something owed. But the one who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited for righteousness. Uh, these verses help us understand John verse, uh, chapter John six, uh, verse uh, twenty nine, uh, because what we see is that it's it's not our works, but it's faith. It's believing in Jesus that um, gives us 
um, uh, righteousness. It, it, it's a credit to us for righteousness. And I want to, uh, the reason I'm emphasizing this, the importance of understanding the, the faith, not the works, is because salvation only comes through faith. And look at verse uh, 27, John 6, verse 27, where it says, which the Son of Man will give you. It's a gift. It's not something earned. It's not credited to them. And so if it's a gift, it's not something owed. And, and they were essentially wanting to understand and learn. They, they wanted to figure out how to get this free food. They wanted to be owed this food. What do I do in order to be um, yeah, uh, this to be given to me? I want to earn this free food, this eternal food. So again, they're, they're misunderstanding, but most importantly, they're missing the point that it's not works, but it's faith. So we have this, um, this, the, these wants, whereas Jesus is saying there's something more important and you're missing the point. And so that leads us to verses 30 through 34, verses 30 through 34. What sign then are you going to do so that we may see and believe you? They asked, what are you going to perform? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, just as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said, Sir, give us this bread always. So um, there, they want this physical bread. Jesus said there's something more important. There's a need in your life, and it's a gift. And then they said, well, what sign are you going to give? They references, reference the manna that was provided to the Israelites. It's kind of interesting to understand that the reason that the Israelites were wandering in the wilderness is because of their uh, lack of faith, not believing that God would uh, bring them into the promised land. So they wandered for 40 years and they needed this food, uh, the manna, uh, because of their lack of faith. So I think it's a, a good, uh, it's a, a just comparison. But they're asking for a sign. Uh, they're wanting something to prove to them that they should believe in Jesus. And so I guess the question for us to ask is, do you think that their request for a sign was genuine? Do, do they, did they really want that? Uh, it's possible. Uh, maybe a few of them, some of them may have possibly wanted a sign, but I would say not likely. Uh, remember, they just saw Jesus feed the 5,000 from loaves, from five loaves and two fish. Uh, so they saw a sign already. They wanted something more, though. Uh, they were they they were seemed to be focused on their physical needs and food, and and were using scripture and hoping to twist or manipulate Jesus into giving them uh, essentially a, a free lunch. And and they were uh, limiting and rejecting what had already been done. Uh, that's actually how Jesus started in verse twenty six. You're looking for me not because you saw the signs but because you ate the loaves and were filled. So their selfish desire, uh, their request for a sign, was still focused on the physical rather than what was important. Uh, one thing that's interesting to note is that it's possible that they were essentially saying, well, you're, you're, the miracle that just happened wasn't quite good enough. Uh, what you did, it was impressive. 5,000 people, uh, five loaves, two fish. Okay, but Moses, he provided uh, food uh, for 40 years for a whole nation. And so uh, what are you going to do to demonstrate that you're better than Moses? You're more uh, powerful. You're better than Moses because the Messiah, they would expect to be greater than the past prophets because of how important the Messiah is. And so they're saying, really, are you truly going to be able to provide what you have promised, what you have offered? And so, uh, what we see here in these verses is very much this skeptic, skepticism. Um, and so, Jesus responds, verse 32, um, he, he acknowledges that, hey, you missed the point. Moses didn't give it. God is the one who gives it. And so, uh, you're missing the point. Mo uh, Moses is not uh, the, the one that you need to honor and glorify, but it's God. Uh, so, he says, um, but my heavenly Father gives you the true bread from heaven. So Jesus um, uh, very much turns the conversation to what's important instead of what they were hoping to get out of it. And so uh, what do you think? What, why do you think that Jesus emphasized the source of the manna? Why is that important? Well, if you think about it, the, uh, the people were um, misattributing the, the, the um, credit 
to Moses. Uh, They were comparing Jesus to Moses and weren't impressed with him, but ultimately they were missing the meaning behind Jesus' words. The manna was temporary, the manna was physical, whereas the uh, bread of life was eternal and then spiritual. And so we're going to get to it in just a minute and, and see Jesus say, I am the bread of life, but they were still focused on the physical. So he's, he's turning uh, the conversation to what is important, and it's eternal life. It's, it's this forgiveness of sins. It's this belief in Christ Jesus. And so um, that's, what they're, uh, that's what Jesus is trying to do for them. Um, and so, verse 34, they said, Sir, give us this bread always. So again, we see this misunderstanding. Uh, They didn't understand what Jesus was saying. It's very similar to the woman at the well. At first she was saying, well, give me this this water so I don't have to come back and get more water. I don't have to thirst again. They were saying, well, give it to us always. Give us this bread always. Uh, And so while it seems like they were kind of coming around to it, they still didn't understand well, the offer that Jesus was, was providing to them. They wanted physical food. He was wanting to um, provide eternal life uh, through uh, belief and trust in Him. So what does that bring us to? It brings us to where true satisfaction is only found in Jesus. So looking at verse 35 through 40. Verse 35 says, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. No one comes to me No one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. But as I told you, you've seen me and yet do not believe. Everyone the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those he has given me, but should raise them up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. Satisfaction, true satisfaction, our true hope is only in Jesus. And so, um, what we see is this command, or excuse me, this statement of Jesus, the I am. Uh, in fact, throughout the Gospel of John, we have seven signs that is that were performed uh, to affirm Jesus and his uh, his identity as the Messiah uh, and his deity. But also, we have seven I am statements, and so he he talks about I am uh, the vine, I am the the way, I am the truth, uh, and here we see I am the bread of life, and so uh, this is the first. I am statement in the seven statements in John's gospel, and it points back uh, to Moses' encounter with God in Exodus chapter 3. Moses encounters God, and he introduces, uh, God uh, replies to Moses, I am who I am. And so uh, we see the statement uh, where Jesus is, is making a bold claim. A little bit later in this chapter, uh, they, the Jewish people, the, 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 um, the crowd understood what was being said. Um, they saw his claim as, as being, whoa, this is, this is something different. And so um, Jesus is a claiming to be the source of eternal spiritual nourishment, the bread of life. Only Jesus can bring this satisfaction. Only he can because he has the authority to do it. And so the people had come looking only for physical food, but Jesus had to offer something significantly better, which was eternal life. And so verse 35, a very important verse, and he says, if anyone who comes to me will not, never, will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. And so we see this promise, this, this, um, this bold statement, yet a powerful and important statement. And so he didn't want them to be confused what he was claiming. He was claiming to be the bread, this eternal life. They wanted physical food. They needed a relationship with God. So um, when we see in verse 36 through 37, though, we see this statement. Uh, But I, I told you, as I told you, you've seen me and yet you do not believe. Everyone the Father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. So what does it mean to come to Jesus. We look at these verses and we see some information and talk about it, but what does it mean to come to Jesus? We use that phrase and oftentimes we talk about 
coming to Jesus, placing your trust and 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 asking for forgiveness. Hope your hope and your trust is in Him, and and I think that's very accurate. Look at verse thirty five again. Uh, I think that helps us as we are going to read the um, next couple of verses. It says, "No one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again." So these two phrases, come to me and believes in me, are in parallel, meaning the one who comes to Jesus is the one who believes in Jesus. And so what it means to come is to believe, to trust in what Jesus said and to trust in who he is and to, to rely on what he has offered and the promises that he gives. And so he's, he's saying they, they had not believed. He, he, he said who he was. Uh, I told you, you've seen me and yet you do not believe. They've seen the signs, they've seen what he said, but yet they still do not believe that he is the Messiah. And so, uh, verses 38 through 40, it's kind of a continuation of this, where Jesus uh, gives this promise and this affirmation of God's will, and, and the purpose of him being there is to bring salvation. So, we're looking at verse number uh, 38 through 40. We've already read it, but it says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So what is the will of God? It is that I should lose none of those he has given me, but should raise them up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. And that's the the, the purpose of Jesus coming, is to offer this eternal life. And so, um, why do you think Jesus repeated himself? In verses, um, in these verses, he, he said essentially, this is the will of him who sent me. And then later on, it says, for this is the will of my father. And so both times in those verses, 39 and 40, it seems like Jesus is repeating himself. Why would Jesus repeat himself when talking about the father's will and the promise? Well, it's likely because repetition emphasizes the importance of a matter. And I would say even more so in the Jewish culture. When you repeat something, you are drawing attention to it. You're making sure people hear it and understand it. And so Jesus was clearly making an appeal for this crowd, for the people in the crowd, to hear and to believe. And and so the same appeal is being made today. Hear the gospel and believe in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And so Romans 10, 9, it says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, this eternal life. Uh, 1 John 4, 15, it says, Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in him, and he in God. And so uh, this appeal, he's he's wanting to make it very clear to them what he is offering. It's a, a offer of salvation, eternal life, through faith in him. And so what what comes to your mind, though, when you think about the word security? Maybe you think about uh, fences or locks, cameras, uh, some stuff like that. Uh, you, when we think of security, we think of safety. We think of um, some, some, a place that you don't have to be concerned about, perhaps. You don't have to worry about things. And so security brings to mind a lot of different things. But um, when we think about it, and what Jesus is speaking about here, what he talks about is that there's an, a, a security of salvation. What, why is it important? What's the importance of having the assurance of security and salvation, of being secure in our salvation. Why is that important? Well, for a couple of things, um, if you think about it, assurance of salvation frees us from the human tendency of legalism. If you're not sure of your salvation, then you're kind of like these individuals in the crowd who are saying, well, what are the works I need to do in order to earn this gift, uh, this, this, uh, this eternal life? What do I need to do in order to earn it? So assurance of salvation is, is freeing from the legalistic tendencies that we have. And yes, we, we should uh, abide in, tr- in God's word. We should obey God's commands. We should pursue uh, righteousness and doing what is right. But it's not in order to earn God's favor, but in response to the, the graciousness that he has given us. And so this assurance of the salvation frees us from the human tendency of legalism. Uh, assurance of salvation also brings peace to our lives. It brings this uh, peace and, and uh, uh, lack of worry and concern. Uh, it, it is the hope that we have, and it's, it's a peaceful thing. It, assurance brings this peace, but it also motivates us to share this good news with others. And so uh, we're looking at these verses, and, and Jesus is making a, cl- a, a bold 
promise that anyone who believes and comes to Christ will be kept and will be raised up, will have eternal life. So we, we started this passage um, by talking about what's the difference between a want and a need and, and how those can be confused. And they wanted this free food. They wanted this meal. Yet Jesus understood they needed something more. And so what's the application of this passage? Jesus provides spiritual food that always satisfies. Jesus provides spiritual food that always satisfies. And so uh, people, uh, we, uh, you and I, we need to examine our motives for following Jesus. Are, are we coming with the wrong motivation? Are we just treating him like Santa Claus who's going to he's going to give us things that we want? Or is there something more, something more important? Uh, believers find true nourishment in the truth of the gospel. Uh, Jesus said, yeah, there's this physical food, but there's this spiritual food that needs to be uh, received by all people. And so he's, he's saying, I am the bread of life. I, I, I am going to satisfy everything you need. And it's most importantly, the spiritual. And so believers security, our security comes through faith in Jesus. And so um, we see this interaction. And so what are some things we can think about? Well, and so I would say this, what are the things that we pursue that offer temporary or counterfeit satisfaction? Sometimes we are just pursuing food. Uh, we want food, the, the things that we think we need. And yes, we do need to eat, but um, there's just temporary satisfaction. Uh, I think there's a lot of distractions in the world that we live in. And so movies, uh, TV shows, hobbies, uh, there are different things that we pursue uh, and the world offers this temporary or counterfeit satisfaction. If you're just, if you get to be the best in your, your, at your work, then you'll be satisfied. If you, if you um, get, get this achievement or you do this or you have, uh, have a, more money or whatever, there's this temporary satisfaction, yet it, it's a, a realization that we must come to to understand that in light of eternity, our only hope, our only satisfaction is in Christ. And so uh, what can we do? in order to make sure that we are pursuing that which truly satisfies. So, meaning, how do we keep the main thing the main thing? How do we focus on the gospel of Jesus Christ, the one who truly satisfied, satisfies? Now, I would say this, we need to evaluate our motives. Is this for me? Is this something selfish? Or is it for, for God? Is it pursuing His word? Uh, evaluate... Um, the results. If, if I do this thing, if I go and, and spend time on this, does it glorify God or does it dishonor Him? Does it bring uh, shame to the gospel? Is it glorifying to Him or not? And then I would say this, we need to take steps to change our desires. As we spend time in Scripture, as we have prayer, as we uh, are in accountability with other believers, uh, we are going to grow closer to God and we're going to pursue Him. We're going to um, exchange the, this temporal satisfaction, uh, and we're going to focus and, and desire the eternal satisfaction of drawing closer to Christ. Um, what we see here is what Jesus says, there's more to life than physical needs. And, and, and he's saying, you come to me wanting this food, but you should be coming to me wanting eternal life. And that's the purpose of John, the Gospel of John. We've talked about it um, in, in the last chapter or last two chapters. He says, these have been written so that you will believe in the Son of, uh, the Son of God. You will believe in Jesus Christ. And so uh, that's the goal here. Jesus' encounter with this crowd was about the most important thing, the most important decision that they could make. So uh, I hope that you see this, uh, you evaluate your desires, and, and understand that there's something more that we need. There's a gospel, a good news of Jesus Christ. I'm going to pray for us and we'll be dismissed. Dear God, thank you for your love and your mercy. Thank you for how you are working in our lives and uh, this, uh, the fact that sometimes we think we want something, but you have uh, uh, the true need of our life. And so, God, as we draw closer to you, as we uh, pursue after you, as we trust in you for the bread of life, God, I pray that we will do so in a means that glorifies you, that honors you. And so we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.